Good afternoon, everyone. It is Friday, February the 19th, 2021. It is currently 1228 p.m. Central Time, and I am so happy to be back here in the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church to be once again sitting in front of this microphone, live on the air, able to talk about all the things we need to talk about. I'm I'm excited to be back. It's been way too long, and I hate... I hate when there's been a long delay keeping me from the microphone, keeping me from the pulpit, because I always feel when I come back that I'm overwhelmed. I feel like I'm I'm underwater and I'm just trying to swim back to the surface because so much has happened. There has been there are so many things to talk about. Uh, So many people have emailed me different things, links to this. uh, What about this and this? And look, I want to get to everything. I want to get to everything. I know I'm not going to be able to get to everything today. And I know that that may, that what I may choose to do here may not be the thing you want to talk about, but I feel we need to return to this subject today because, well, it's been a long time. If you don't remember, on February the 2nd, on February the 2nd, 2021, I began a new series that we are re- that we are calling the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, now, the first uh, episode was the Sermon on the Mount Interpretation Part 1. And then on February the 3rd, we did the Sermon on the Mount Interpretation Part 2. Then on February the 4th, we did the Sermon on the Mount Outline Part 1. And then on February the 5th, we did one called the Sermon on the Mount Is Jesus the Blessed Person? And then on February the 6th, we did the Sermon on the Mount Outline Part 2. So we, and if you don't remember, the whole reason we started this series is uh, some friends in Nebraska attend a church in Iowa, and they said, hey, we're about to begin a, a, a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What, you know, what view is your pastor going to use in interpreting, uh, interpreting it? And so we started talking and I thought, you know what, that'll, it'll be, it'll be fun. I'll listen, since I'm going to probably listen to all of the sermons from that church, it'd be fun to take those sermons. We'll play them here live on the air. We'll see how they interpret it. I'll offer my own interpretation. And what we'll try to do is by, by the time we're done, everyone who listens to every episode that we do, By the time they're done, hopefully they'll have the best understanding they've ever had in their entire Christian life on the Sermon on the Mount. They'll know all the different ways people approach it. They'll be challenged to look things up. And and I I really think it, I I think it's going to be a a very important time of study because the Sermon on the Mount is obviously very well known. Pastors quote it all the time. Christians quote from it all the time. But do we really understand it? Are we quoting those sections from the Sermon on the Mount in their proper context? What what me- the methods we use to interpret the Sermon on the Mount, are they the correct method? Have we really asked if we are consistent with the interpretation? We we say, hey, here's, here's how you understand the Sermon on the Mount. And then in practice, we don't even live in accordance with the way we interpret the sermon itself. So I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to do my best to help challenge. Well, put it this way. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I know other people think that their understanding is correct. So I'm going to do everything in my power to challenge all of our understanding um, to try to see that we can get hopefully as close to possible of, of understanding the Sermon on the Mount and it's cr- in the correct way. I, I've already stated this a number of times, I am asking you and I'm doing the same to take everything you've ever thought you knew about the Sermon on the Mount to take the ways you've interpreted the Sermon on the Mount and the past and set that aside. Let's open up our Bibles and let's get back to the Sermon on the Mount and, you know, in a new study, which doesn't rely on our past interpretations and our past understanding. You, You hear me say it all the time. Your past understanding is of no benefit when you study the Bible today, because if you rely on your past understanding, if you were wrong in the past, you're going to simply bring that error into the present. And you don't want that. Every time you study the Bible, you want to study it anew, afresh, laying aside previous studies and looking at it again to see if, if with, 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 with fresh eyes to ensure that if you've made any mistakes, hopefully you can, you can catch those mistakes this time and move to a better understanding. Always moving forward, always trying to grow in our understanding. So what we're going to do today is I've got sermon number one from the church in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Now, here's the thing I'm I'm not going to do. 
I'm not going to give the name of the pastor. I'm not going to give the name of the church. And here's the reason why. Look, I have no idea how much I may understand. Uh, I may agree. I have uh, no idea how much I may disagree. Remember how I do these reviews. I listen to them with you. Now, I've already started listening to this and made it pretty far. So in this one, I've kind of cheated a little bit. But because I don't ultimately know where he's going, I, I don't I don't want this to turn into, oh, he just hates that pastor. He just hates that church. He's picking on that pastor. It's, this is nothing about... Uh, 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 this is this is nothing personal about a church or a pastor. This is about us saying, oh, you're working on the Sermon on the Mount? Okay, we're going to listen to what you do, and then we're going to use that as kind of a starting point for a conversation and discussion and study on the Sermon on the Mount. This is not about trying to attack anyone, criticize anyone. It's not about, it's nothing like that. It's like, oh, you're preaching on the Sermon on the Mount? You're posting your sermons on the internet? Okay. Well, let's listen to what you have to say. And then we'll throw in our thoughts, and hopefully when we're done, you see, the point here is not to criticize. The point here is to be exposed to the way he handles the text. You could, you're going to be exposed to the way I handle the text. And by the, by the time we're done, by hearing different perspectives, hopefully you'll get closer to understanding the text for yourself, all right? So this is not about, hey, here's the name of this church, here's the name of this pastor, and we agree or we disagree. It's none of that. This is about, let's listen to a sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, and let's see what we think about it. And let's, it's, it's, I, I, I try to create this way of thinking that it's, it's, it's along these lines. I try to, I try to create a situation that feels like you just came over to my house and we're going to sit down and listen to sermons together and we're going to talk about it and we're going to discuss it. Because I used to love to do that with my friends in Nebraska that would come over we listen to sermons and talk and talk hours and hours about the sermons and pull out our Bibles and, and grab notebooks. And that, that, was, that was always so edifying and fun. Not, not to act like that we knew more, not to be super critical, but to be challenged. Now, we, don't, we didn't always agree, but it was, it was just to me fun to hear the Word of God preached and then try to learn from how other people saw it and try to figure out why they saw it that way. So I hope you're ready. So if you have a Bible... Matthew chapter 5. If you have a notebook, definitely grab one. I know sometimes people listening while they're driving and you can't do that, but you, you definitely want to take notes. We're going to try to figure out how he's going to approach the Sermon on the Mount, and then we will talk about it. Now, it looks like that in sermon number one, this pastor covered Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12. I don't know how that's humanly possible. I didn't even think that was humanly possible. So already we would have a disagreement there. There's no way I could preach the Sermon on the Mount and cover 12 verses and one sermon. There's just no way. I could do that like in a devotional study, maybe, or in a Bible study exercise, but that I wouldn't be covering the 12 verses. I would then be giving you steps to go study those 12 verses for yourself. So uh, already there, we're, we're off to a very different approaches to the way we, we would handle the Sermon on the Mount. At this rate, if he's going to cover 12 verses at a time, or something like that. He'll he'll be through the the Sermon on the Mount in a couple of weeks where it would take me, and I'm not joking, it would take me a couple of years because there's so much to unpack. But uh, we'll we'll see how this goes. Are you ready? All right, so we're going to go to Council Bluffs, Iowa. This was from last Sunday where they began their their series on the Sermon on the Mount, and this is sermon number one. The text is Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. We're going to listen. We're going to analyze. If you're listening to me live, jump in in the chat at any time. Just, hey, this is what you thought. If you have questions, just, again, like we're all together listening to this sermon together, and we're going to talk about it. So are you ready to jump in and dive in? Again, this is not about being critical. This is not about saying I'm smarter than anyone else. No, this is about, hey, here's this very important section of Scripture what does it mean? Let's see if we can get to that. I know it's a long introduction, but I want to I want to make sure everyone's on the same page because people so misinterpret what I do with sermon reviews. They don't understand the way I approach them. Very different than other podcasters, right? Um, I just I like to sit down and like listen to a sermon, and I'm just inviting you to participate. Here we go, Council Bluffs, Iowa, last Sunday. Here we go. I want to turn there. Matthew 5, 1 through 12, uh, the Beatitudes. And let's ask the Lord to bless our time in the Word. Lord, we thank you now for the the Word of God. 
And uh, Lord, we ask that you might minister to our hearts as we study together, and uh, we thank you for this uh, this wonderful uh, Sermon on the Mount that you gave, uh, and the things that we can glean from it as far as how we should live as your people, uh, those who are headed ultimately for the kingdom. And so, Lord, uh, bless the ministry of the word as it goes forth now, I pray in Christ's name, amen. We are in Matthew. The theme is Christ the King. We are in this section right here in chapters 5 through 7. The pronouncements of the king. uh, Proving his judicial right to the throne as seen in the wisdom of his kingdom teaching. Well, Matthew wrote with a Jewish audience in mind. Let's stop right here. Okay, so he's calling this section the pronouncement of the king. And that this sermon is is to show basically his wisdom and his right to the throne because of the wisdom found in this pronouncement of the kingdom. This is, this is I guess, kingdom teaching. Now, now whenever I, I hear that term, then you, you remember, our, if, you, if you go back and remember the nine different approaches people have to this, some people would say, yes, you're absolutely right. It's kingdom preaching. It's kingdom teaching. These entire teachings, this entire teaching in Matthew 5 is for the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. These teachings have nothing to do for us today. This is laying down the morality for the kingdom. Many dispensationalists would approach it that way. Not all, but some would approach this, that that this section, Matthew 5 through 7, is for the thousand year reign of Christ when he's ruling and reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. And these are the rules for the millennial kingdom. This is the rules you have to abide by in the millennial kingdom. Now, they may say that there's the morality of it is still applicable for us, but primarily it's for them. So when I hear that, that's the first thing I'm like, oh, this is kingdom teaching. Okay, is he going to go the dispensational route? Which way is he going to go? Is he going to go a different route? Well, we're going to have to wait and see. So, just that just that's that's the first thing like if i was taking notes i'd be like oh kingdom and i would i would write down kingdom teaching and i would circle it with a question mark going okay where is he going where where is he going here right this gives me a first clue he he's saying that this is to a jewish audience all right to a jewish audience Again, dispensationalists may say that the main purpose of the millennial kingdom is for the Jews to fulfill the promises to the Jews, all right? So in a sense, it's just setting out, think about it, like in the Old Testament, you had civil law given to Israel and how they were to conduct and live. And is this Jesus laying laying down basically civil law for the uh, millennial kingdom? I get some would go that direction. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm not even saying that's wrong. I'm just trying to give you, I, need, I want you to realize when you come to a section like this, there's a lot of different approaches. And we always think that our approach is 100% correct, but we got to hear the different ones. I don't know which direction. I, well, I already know where, which direction he's getting ready to go, but I just want to help you hear those little clues. When, when you hear a preacher say certain things, you're like, oh, okay, that, that may be a clue on where he's going. But let's, let's keep that in mind, right? Here we go. And now he's going into the fact that this is primarily written for a Jewish uh, audience. Here we go. And he wrote to show them that Jesus is their prophesied Messiah King. As I say, the theme of Matthew with the Jewish audience is Christ the King. Matthew wrote thematically presenting various lines of evidence to show that this is true that he is the prophesied Messiah King. Well, in chapter 4, Matthew shows that the Galilean ministry of Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. There it was prophesied that Galilee of the Gentiles would see a great light, which in context was the Messianic light. Well, Matthew shows that Christ's message in this context was a call to repentance because the kingdom was at hand. It was being presented. The king was now present and the kingdom was now being offered by him on the condition of repentance. Well, Matthew then went on to show that Christ uniquely did kingdom miracles, kingdom miracles of healing to verify that indeed he was the true Messiah in keeping with the prophetic scriptures. Now, what was unique about Christ's miracles, what I call his kingdom miracles, a sample of the kingdom in effect? Well, he healed everyone. He healed them of everything. 
And he did so on a massive scale that included masses of people from regions far and wide. It wasn't just a local setting. We have some of that happening with the apostles later in a different context. But on the scale that Jesus did, no one ever did that before or after. This was kingdom stuff. This was the work of the king presenting his kingdom credentials. Now, we noted last time in chapter 4, Matthew 4, 23... Whoops, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> Matthew 4, 23, uh, there describes Jesus' messianic ministry as including three things. It's Galilee. All right, we gotta, we got to stop right here because I'm trying to figure out something. He says that Matthew 4 is a fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 reads, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Neptali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, that they dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. All right, and then he says that Matthew four is a fulfillment of that. Um, okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, Matthew four a uh, fourteen. All right, so here we go. That it might be fulfilled, which spoke by Isaiah the prophet, saying, "The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee." Okay, okay, there we go. So I, I was trying to make sure exactly where he was going. He didn't give the he didn't give the the, the, the citation. So I wanted to just make sure that we were on the same page there. So there you have. So Matthew 4, um, verses 14, 15, and 16 makes a reference to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. All right. So there we have. So, all right, we're, we're on the same page there. Okay. Again, he's emphasizing kingdom, kingdom concepts here. I'm going to back this up just a little. Right, is it three minutes twenty two? I'm just gonna back it up just a little bit. All right. I'm gonna back it about about a minute. So just so we can flow in context. I just when I heard that, I, I just wanted to make sure that I knew exactly what he was referencing and I saw that because um I was thinking of the part of, of Matthew 4 that I think is also uh, pulling from Isaiah 42. So I had to ch- double check really quick to make sure that we were on the same page. Okay, but uh, that's that's a situation where uh I, at least from my perspective, I would have, I, and I understand that when you're when you're trying to cover twelve verses, you don't have a lot of time. And I tend, I tend to take the perspective of who cares about how fast we go. Let's care about let's care. Not, not, this, we're not worried about speed. We're worried about depth. So I would have taken the time if I'm going to make a claim that Matthew four is a fulfillment of Isaiah nine. I would have stopped to show everyone. Hey, open your Bibles to uh, Isaiah 9, look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 and following, and I want you to see how Matthew says that this was a fulfillment of what happened in Isaiah chapter 9. So I, I, I and I, not all preachers do that because, I, again, they're worried about time, worried about time. I have never been worried about time. Look, each Sunday you have to preach, Right? Each Sunday you have to preach, right? That's that's what you do. You preach every Sunday, Sunday night, and every Wednesday. Hopefully most churches do that. Well, if I have to preach the next week, who cares if I, like, I'm not, why am I in a hurry? Why am I in a hurry? If I've got to preach every week, then let's just, you know, just take your time. And, and I, yeah, I don't know, but people have, and I know that there's all these theories that if you take too long, the people get bored and they lose their focus. And, and so you've got to get through a series quickly because you don't want to be in that series for too long. But I, I don't look, you're coming to church to hear a sermon. Who cares if I'm still in Matthew chapter five, a year later, right? It's still the word of God. It still needs to be taught. So I don't know. You, you, you could give me your own perspective as a, um, I'm speaking from the perspective of a pastor, and, and sometimes the perspective from the pulpit is different from the perspective of in the pew. You, you can be honest. And if you're like, no, if, if we're in Matthew 5 for a year, I'm going to get bored. Uh, you, you just be honest with that and explain to me why. Uh, because, well, because uh, you need to help fix my perspective. All right, but here we go. Let's go back. I backed it up just a little bit. Miracles, what I call his kingdom miracles, a sample of the kingdom in effect 
Well, he healed everyone. He healed them of everything. And he did so on a massive scale that included masses of people from regions far and wide. It wasn't just a local setting. We have some of that happening with the apostles later in a different context. But on the scale that Jesus did, no one ever did that before or after. This was kingdom stuff. This was the work of the king presenting his kingdom credentials. Now, we noted last time in chapter 4, Matthew 4, 23... Whoops, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> Matthew 4:23. Uh, there describes Jesus' messianic ministry as including three things: His Galilean ministry uh, emphasized teaching, preaching, and healing. Now, let me ask you: uh, You're a small audience, but you're very thoughtful. I can tell this morning. You're thinking, "How long is he going to go on?" No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're just getting started here. Uh, which one of these three, we're talking teaching, preaching, and healing, which one of these three really jumps out at you? Which of these three really emphasizes the kingly, messianic nature of Jesus in keeping with the coming kingdom? Well, we would not probably want to emphasize, uh, you know, the teaching, the preaching, yes, the he- but the healing, right? That's what's emphasized here. All kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. His fame went out throughout Syria. They brought to him all sick, afflicted with various diseases, torments, those who were demon-possessed, uh, and so forth. And he healed them. All sick, he healed them. That's what's kind of standing out here in this immediate context here. And certainly, universal healing was one major evidence that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Nobody could do this like Jesus did it. But what about his equally unique teaching ministry? The Messiah's teaching ministry prophetically was to be so unique as to also be a major messianic credential. Note uh, this prophecy, Messianic context, clearly, in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2. And we read there, Of the Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. What kind of a spirit is it going to be? The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So I want you to uh, note this connection here. Uh, Christ began by saying, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And then that's followed up with this emphasis on teaching and preaching. Yes, healing too, but I think really he's saying repent. And now he's going to unpack that in his teaching ministry and say, here's what, it, here's what it's all about. Here's what repentance looks like. And that's what we have in the kingdom ethics presented in chapters 5 through 7. John Phillips says, We have now come to the famous Sermon on the Mount. There is nothing to compare with it in all the literature of the world. We're on sacred ground here, folks. Even the greatest of the world's moral, religious, and philosophical statements blush and stammer in the presence of this sublime declaration. How true that is. Now, when Jesus got done... I have to stop right here and ask a question. A lot of uh, preachers love to find these kinds of quotes. I I do the same thing. When you're getting ready to uh, preach a section of scripture, you find a quote where someone talks about how important it is, how powerful it is, how difficult it may be. And you give that because you want to, you're trying to convince your people of something. Hey, what we're getting ready to study is super important. It's super difficult. So pay close attention. It's, It's a way of trying to persuade your audience that hey we're we're you know, we're on sacred ground we're dealing with some sublime teaching that that you know that is that is understood by everyone and even in the world uh, religious scholars everywhere just understand how sublime and amazing this section of scripture is that's that's a, a, you know it's a, it's part of persuasive speech you're persuading your audience that hey what we're about to study is worth your time and your attention so i understand that uh That method of speaking, I understand that. You learn that in speech class about persuasive speaking, uh, speaking, um, persuasive speeches. So I understand the reason for doing that. But here's the question, and I think we have to ask ourselves. We give give a lot of 
lip service to the Sermon on the Mount, right? We talk about how amazing it is, how powerful it is. It shows the wisdom of God. It's amazing. It's powerful. But but we always do that, I feel, on the outset. When we start the Sermon on the Mount, how amazing it is. And then when we get into the details of the sermon, and when Jesus says certain things, then we immediately question God's will. Well, he didn't He didn't really mean turn the other cheek. He, he didn't really mean love your enemy. He didn't really mean resist not evil. He didn't really... Then we do a lot of explaining it away. We talk about how amazing it is, how beautiful it is, how powerful it is, how wise it is. And then when we get into it, we do a lot of trying to explain it away. And that always bothers me. It's like when you hear the first sermon on the Sermon on the Mount, this is going to demonstrate the wisdom of God. And then as soon as we don't like the wisdom of God, then we we, we try to back, we try to take a couple of steps back to say, he didn't really mean what he seemed to say. Because it would go against our wisdom. But if it if it's truly a sermon that contains the wisdom of God, you have to go into it realizing it's not going to be your wisdom. It's not going to be your thoughts. It's not going to be your ways. So are we either go are we going to go into it with a willingness to change our way of thinking and submit to it? Or are we simply going to go in and take in the things that we agree with? Because of course the things we agree with, of course. Of course, that's the wisdom of God. And the things we disagree with, well, clearly God didn't mean that. And I think we play that game frequently. I think we play that. I just think sometimes we give such, such, you know, lofty words to how amazing the Sermon on the Mount is. And then when we get into it, it just seems like we do a lot of trying to change it. I just feel that I, I hear that all the time. And we'll see if he does that. We'll see if he does that. All right. But here you go. So, so far. He's not giving us an outline of the sermon. He's not really giving us an interpretive clue. He's not even going through the different methods of interpreting it yet. We'll, we'll see where he, he's going to go. We'll see where he's going to go. All right, here, here, so here, just want to throw in that thought. Here we go. Teaching what we call the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. What was the response? Well, we read about it in Matthew chapter 7, 28, 29. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. They were astonished at his teaching. This, it blew their minds. It blew them away. Why? For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, I, 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 think, I, I do think this is awesome that he goes to Matthew 7 here uh, at the beginning of the sermon showing how people respond responded to it at the end of the sermon. I think that's real that's really smart and really and really good. And I and I like that approach. But I just think that when we when we get done with the Sermon on the Mount, I wonder if if the people who listen to any any sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, I wonder when they're done, if they are truly astonished. If they're truly blown away. I I, I wonder if we're really astonished at it. Because it just seems to me that we, we say we're astonished, but we do a lot of just manipulating it and to, to make it fit. Look, when you, when, if, it, if you read it and you're like, oh, well, this is, you know, Jesus agrees with me about everything. Jesus agrees with me about guns. He agrees with me about self-defense. He agrees with me about divorce. He, he agrees with me with everything. I, I just, I don't know if we come across as like, whoa, astonished and amazed. I think when we read it and realize how different it is to the way we think, then it is astonishing. And then we are amazed by it. I, I just think we, we I, I think that's what we're supposed to say. I just, I don't know if we, I think we do a lot of just trying to manipulate the sermon. I, I really feel that way. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you disagree. I just think that there, I mean, I see verses quoted all the time from Sermon on the Mount, and I just sometimes you just have to shake your head, going, "Really, that that that's what you think it means, really?" Um, and it's just again, everyone seems to use it for their own benefit. Um, but I I hope that by the time we're done, you are astonished and amazed at what Jesus actually taught in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't care how many times you've read it. I hope that that's that's the feeling we all have at the conclusion. You see, he taught them with the authority of the Messianic King which he was. Thus, his profound part, excellent teaching was a major evidence that he was indeed the king presenting the kingdom. His miracles proved that he was the king presenting the kingdom. His teaching also verified that he was the king presenting the kingdom, presenting a kingdom ethic, uh, 
in effect, that which will govern his reign. But again, what is the significance of this teaching? Well, scholars have long debated the exact significance of it. Moody Bible Commentary says, The Sermon on the Mount is probably the most famous of all the teachings of Christ, but it is difficult to determine exactly what the purpose is. Well, all right, now stop right there. See, now I do like the fact that he acknowledges that, hey, here's, a, here, here, here's at least one commentary he's saying it's difficult to know exactly what the purpose of this teaching is. And I gave you nine different approaches. What exactly is the purpose of this teaching? Is this to tell you how to live your life right now? Is this to tell us how we're going to live in the millennial kingdom? Is this simply to demonstrate a, a, a morality that you and I cannot keep? And we have to look to Jesus Christ, who is the blessed person, because he did keep all of this teaching in his life. And therefore, I I am blessed in Jesus Christ because his righteousness and his obedience to this, this ethic is then applied to my account. Is that how we understand? There's a lot of different approaches, all right? So I'm glad he's acknowledging, hey, there are people out there who say this difficult, but listen to what he's about to say, all right? So it is difficult, but listen to what he's about to say. Well, that's pretty, pretty common statement there. People say, well, what is exactly does it mean? Some say, well, I think it's, it shows you how to be saved. Others say, no, 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 that's not it. Others say, well, no, it, it, it's kingdom teaching applies only to the kingdom in the future. No, no, others say, no, 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 that's not it. Uh, it also has application. Round and round and round we go. How should we understand this? Well, I think if we think in context, realizing the thematic format of Matthew, I don't know that it should be that difficult. Okay, now that's, <laughs> that's always, uh, I, oh boy, this, this is always a red flag to me. I, 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 I it, it drives me crazy that, that preachers stand behind a pulpit and say, I, I don't know why it should be so difficult. I really don't think it should be that difficult. Everyone says you don't think it should be that difficult, but for 2,000 years, why has it been so difficult? If you, so you're telling me that, hey, you don't think it should be that difficult, so all of this struggle to figure it out for 2,000 years is just because people don't know as much as you, they're not as qualified to teach as you, you just know more, you have more qualifications, you have more understanding than all of these you know, scholars and theologians and, and church fathers, all of them, they just didn't get it, but you've got it figured out. I, I know when preachers say that, I know they don't really mean it that way, but that's how it comes across. And especially if you're sitting in the pew and you're like, wait a minute, I've read 13 commentaries this week on it and I've gotten 57 different interpretations and you're telling me that it's easy? So if it's easy, all of these commentaries are wrong. All of these preachers are wrong, but you figured it out. You figured it out. Well, that... I, I'm glad I'm a member of this church. Uh, I, I don't try to do that. I try to say, no, guys, this is difficult. What, this is why I try to train my people. Whenever we come to a passage and we find that there are countless interpretations, that should always be a warning to all of us that we are approaching something very difficult and we may not be able to be very dogmatic about it because no one can agree on it. I don't try to approach it. Hey, you know, all of those people out there, they're confused. Well, I'm so glad you're a member of Victory Baptist Church because we've got it all figured out right here. I try to say, no, this is obviously difficult and we're going to struggle through it. And, and, and we cannot be, we may have to walk away not being so dogmatic. But if preachers always like, hey, everyone else says it's difficult. But people do that with the book of Revelation. Everyone says it's difficult. I don't know what's so difficult about it. Wait, give me a second. Let me go grab my commentary here that I'm going to use. Okay, According to this commentary, it's not difficult. Okay, According to whatever Bible commentary you like, it's not difficult. Yeah, because you're following what someone told you it means. I, I think I, I don't like that approach. Maybe you do. I, I don't. I, I like a pastor who says, man, there are a lot of different uh, interpretations out there. Let's consider all of them. And as we go through this section, we're going to consider all the different approaches and see which ones work and which ones don't, which ones we can eliminate and which ones we can't eliminate. And we may have to end up eliminating the one that I think is going to work because I've, I, that's the way I always try to approach it. Now, some people don't like that kind of preaching because when they're done, they're like, well, I'm more confused than when we started. Well, that's the pursuit of truth can lead you to the valley of confusion over and over and over again. In fact, if I've, I feel like if you don't spend a lot of time in the valley of confusion, you're not really pursuing truth. 
Some people like certainty over truth. They want easy answers over truth. And, and I, I, I reject that completely. No, we're going to the Valley of Confusion, and we're going to spend some time there until we can figure out what the truth is. So um, I just, I, oh, as soon as I hear, you know, I don't know what's so complicated about it. Yeah, because the people who wrote that commentary that you read, they couldn't figure it out, but you can. So maybe you should publish a commentary since you've got the answers and you can correct 2,000 years of struggle over this. But no, there's a lot of people who don't understand what Jesus is trying to do here. How should we interpret it? Some people do interpret it as, no, you've got to do this to be saved. Some people say, no, this is showing you that you need Jesus because you can't follow this. Others are saying, no, you can follow this. Some say, no, this is future. There's, again, not, I could give you probably 12 or 13, maybe even 14 different approaches in church history that people have taken on Matthew 5 through 7. So, I just think you do a disservice when you tell the people, I don't think it's that hard. And then they walk away thinking, oh, no, it's not that hard. My pastor's got it figured out. No, let your people understand the difficulty there so that when they come in contact with all of these different views, they're not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That's what equipping saints is about. Not telling them it's easy. And as soon as they get out there and get confronted with different ideas, they realize maybe it's not as easy as everyone told me that it was. It's not that easy. There's lots of questions. And trust me, whatever view you go with, you've got it, it's got its own problems and difficulties. All right. So, all right, let's let's just continue. That's just whenever I hear that in any sermon, you know, anytime I review a sermon and, and the pastor says that, you know I'm getting ready to, to push uh, uh, the button on the microphone and go and, and come back in. You know that. Um, because I always I say that over and over and over. I cannot, I cannot stand that. It drives me crazy. And I, and I understand preachers want, they want to look like, I guess, I don't know why preachers do it. I know that there's a, look, there's a part of me whenever I turn on the microphone or I stand behind the pulpit, I want the people to think that I'm smart and I want the people to think I have the answers and I do want people to think I have it figured out. That is, that is a part of my, you know, makeup as a human being, you know, male ego, whatever the case may be. But I learned a long time ago, it's better just to say, hey, I'm with you. Let's struggle. Let's try to find the answer. It's, it's better for me to stand there going, you know what? I don't even know if I have this figured out. I, it's better for me to struggle with it and then maybe three weeks later I have to come out and go, you know what, I think I was wrong there. I think it's better to do that than just try to give everyone some sense of certainty when there really isn't certainty. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, maybe some people don't like that approach. They want their preacher to know. Well, I, I'm sorry. I, there's a lot of things I don't know. <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't know, okay? Uh, about the only thing I know is there is a God and I'm not him. Okay, that's that's about it. And I know that's taken from, I think it's taken from the movie Rudy, okay? So um, so yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's where I got my theology from. No, but that, I, I knew that before I heard that line in that movie um, because you just start, the more you study, the more you realize you don't know. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, education, one of my Bible... Uh, professors said uh, that the goal of education is to, to make you realize how stupid you really are. Um, that's what education, that, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And if, if, if learning puffs you up into thinking that you actually know more than you do, then that's not education. Education is a constant reminder of what you don't know. And the more you study the Bible, the more you should come to this realization. You don't have it all figured out. You don't have it all. You think you know it all. You think you've got it all figured out, but you don't. And, uh, and when we don't have, we don't, we, there's a lot we don't understand about Matthew 5 through 7. There's a lot. All right, so let's continue. Matthew does not simply go from chapter 4 to chapter 5 without design. There is a connection here. The message in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7 continues on with the kingdom theme. That's what we're talking about. The kingdom theme. The Sermon on the Mount does not present the way of salvation, but rather presents kingdom ethics, which are indicative of the repentance called for by Christ in view of the kingdom being at hand. The Sermon on the Mount really amounts to a detailed explanation of what true repentance looks like in the lives of those prepared to enter the kingdom. All right, now stop right there. So the Sermon on the Mount demonstrates what true repentance looks like. If you have truly repented, Matthew 5 through 7, that's you. Now, 
That sounds good, but I want you to put that, I want you to really think about that. You look at your life and does, is your life consistent with Matthew 5 through 7? Is your life consistent with Matthew 5 through 7? If it's not, then you haven't truly repented. I will argue that if you're not careful with this kind of teaching, if anyone in the pew is honest with themselves and really to look in the mirror, everyone's going to convince themselves they're not saved. I don't know how people could say, yeah, Matthew 5 through 7, that's what true repentance looks like. You want to, oh, you say you've repented? Here you go. Here's the checklist. Here's the checklist to verify the, the sincerity of one's repentance. Now, I, I'm not saying that's how, I'm not saying that's what he intended. I'm not saying that that's what he meant to say, but that, that statement in itself is teaching that very, un, that very idea that this is what genuine repentance looks like. So if you've genuine, rep- genu- genuinely repented, if I can speak correctly, then your life will look like Matthew 5 through 7. Just take that, put that into practice. Just put that into practice. Blessed are they which do, which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Unless you truly hunger and thirst after righteousness, you haven't repented. Well, there's a lot of Christians who don't seem to truly hunger and thirst after righteousness. They hunger and thirst for a lot of different things. They spend all of their time doing other things, pursuing other things, hobbies, entertainment, fun, activities, family, you name it. And Jesus, no, you've got to hunger and thirst after righteousness or you haven't repented. This is what repentance looks like. Now, of course, I know what Christians will say, but no, 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 no. We're not talking about doing it perfectly. We're talking about, you know, what, that, that's the general, general direction of your life. So you're saying that true repentance just means that the general direction of your life will demonstrate some level of hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That if you've truly repented, then you won't, let me see here. Let's just pick some other things from the sermon. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's just pick. Let's just see here. Um, there's so many things here uh, that that uh, that your righteousness will exceed uh, that of, of of the Pharisees. All right. Um, how about let's see. Let, let's find some other ones here. Um, oh, th- so if you if you've truly repented, you will not look at a woman with lust. Well, I mean, no. I mean, I'm not going to do that perfectly. Uh, so, so what is genuine? Re- does genuine repentance look like the Sermon on the Mount, or does genuine repentance just look like that you kind of trying to live that way? Like it, you've got to explain that because Jesus says in Matthew chapter five. I'll just read it here uh, because there's so many. But I say unto you, Matthew five twenty eight, that whosoever looketh on a woman. Uh, a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So if you, if you look at a woman with lust, is that not showing, is is that not showing genuine repentance? Well, it's not showing genuine repentance. Well, if your repentance is not genuine, then you're not saved. So this literally, if you're not careful, this creates a situation where how do you know you're saved? You follow the Sermon on the Mount. How do you know you're not saved? You don't follow the Sermon on the Mount. Well, who actually follows the Sermon on the Mount? Well, then they always backtrack and say, well, we're not saying you have to do it perfectly. Again, well, then how much do I have to do to ensure that I'm saved, that my repentance was genuine? This this gets to a very, if you're not careful, you slide into a works-based salvation. How do I know I'm saved? Not because of what Christ did, but because of what I'm doing. Well, the way I know I'm saved is because what Christ did. Christ did fulfill everything in the in the Sermon on the Mount. He fulfilled the Ten Commandments, and his passive and active obedience is imputed to my account. That's the whole Protestant concept of imputation. It's not like my, my repentance is genuine because of what I do. My, my, my repentance is genuine when I trust in Christ and him alone for my salvation. I'm turning to him alone for my salvation. So this is a little, this gets a little uh, difficult. I think we see the direction he's going. This this is almost now, it, it's becoming a proof of one's repentance. I'm going to back that up just a little bit because I want us to hear it again. Here we go. All right. I'm, I'm backing it up just a little bit. I'll put it in its context and we'll listen to it again and make sure that I'm hearing it correctly. Out in Matthew 5 through 7, continues on with the kingdom theme. That's what we're talking about, the kingdom theme. The Sermon on the Mount does not present the way of salvation, but rather presents kingdom ethics, which are indicative 
of the repentance called for by Christ in view of the kingdom being at hand. The Sermon on the Mount really amounts to a detailed explanation of what true repentance looks like in the lives of those prepared to enter the kingdom. Uh, Note this quote uh, from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Jesus' sermon, therefore, must be understood in the context of of his offer of the kingdom to Israel and the need for repentance to enter the kingdom. Well, that's a great statement right there. The sermon showed how a person who is right in right relationship with God, I inserted a true repenter, should now conduct his life. The sermon should now conduct his life. Please note, a true repenter, that's his words. This is a sign of a true repenter. A true repenter. Now, if this was for Israel and their offer into the kingdom, hey, if you want to get into the millennial kingdom, here's what you have to do. Okay, well, we can get that. That goes in a different direction, but he's making this, that this is about you and me. If we are going to be in the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God, we have to be a true repenter. The way we know we're a true repenter is we have to follow the Sermon on the Mount. Well, who then is a true repenter? Is the people, I mean, I... I, I don't, I cannot say this dogmatically, but I'm pretty sure that the people sitting in the pew listening to this sermon then by, by the standards of Matthew 5 through 7 are not true repenters so that no one in the church and council bluffs is going to be in the kingdom of God, including the one preaching it. Because there's no way that they fulfill this on any regular consistent basis. They violate it time and time and time again. And so do I. I, I don't match up to it. You don't match up to it. And so then you have to say, so you have to say it's a sign of true repentance, but then you have to do this really weird, like play these like verbal gymnastics. But, 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 but no one's going to do it perfectly, but, but it's the general direction of your life. So, so like how, what does it look like? Like, it, you remember when I ask these questions, people sometimes think I'm just taking an, an idea and trying to be absurd, but I'm not. You're dealing with someone's salvation. So you've got to be specific of what that means. Hey, guys, this sermon that you're about to listen to, it's going to prove whether you are a genuine repenter or if you're a fake. Now, if if everyone in that audience was, was honest with themselves, they would immediately go, woe is me, I am undone. I'm not going to live up to this. But what you have to do is you have to convince yourself that you do. You have to put on fig leaves and cover up the evidence that you don't live up to this. Jesus is taking an ethic that goes way beyond your external actions to the inward attitudes of your heart. You fall short of this over and over and over again. So I'm already concerned that, wait, this is what a genuine repenter looks like. This is a genuine repenter. Well, yeah, okay, Let, let's continue. I'm going to back it up just one more time because I want you to keep hearing. Here's, here's, we're getting his method of interpretation that he's going to use right here. Let's back it up. We're obviously not going to finish this this time, but that's okay. Let's back it up just a little bit. I'm going to go back just a little bit. All right, here we go. Let's listen to it again. The amount really amounts to a detailed explanation of what true repentance looks like in the lives of those prepared to enter the kingdom. Uh, Note this quote uh, from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Jesus' sermon, therefore, must be understood in the context of of his offer of the kingdom to Israel and the need for repentance to enter the kingdom. Well, that's a great statement right there. The sermon showed how a person who is right in right relationship with God, uh, I inserted a true repenter, should now conduct his life. The sermon applies to Jesus' followers today for it demonstrates the standard of kingdom righteousness God demands of his kingdom citizens. There is a kingdom ethic, if you will, applied to the church today as seen in the New Testament. And I will develop this as we go along in our message this morning. We can only live out this kingdom ethic by the power of the Holy Spirit as seen in accordance with the new covenant, which is indicative of kingdom reality. All right, now I want you to hear this. We can only live this out through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember when I gave you the different interpretations, I told you this is a standard way that, that one, of the, one of the methods of interpreting the Sermon on the Mount is it's applicable for you. And with that comes the idea that you can keep it with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So you have the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore you can keep it. This is a common idea within the evangelical church. We all believe, we, we claim we have a power. Look, we have a power to keep the Sermon on the Mount. Those other people out there, they don't. The Muslims, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They can't keep it. Mormons, any, anyone who's not a Christian, they can't keep the Sermon on the Mount. But we can as evangelicals. We can keep the Sermon on the Mount. I'm assuming we can keep the Ten Commandments. We can keep the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, we can keep the entire law of God because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We convince ourselves of having some supernatural power to live in accordance to God's standards. So therefore, look, why, why did Jesus even die? Just say, hey, here, here, guys, here's my law. Here's my Holy Spirit. Now you keep the law. You keep the law, you'll be good enough to get into heaven. Now, it seems that what Jesus simply did is he simply died to forgive us of what our, of our guilt and Adam. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit. And now it's up to us to live in accordance to, to, to all of these rules. And if we don't live according, according to all of these rules, then we didn't truly repent. We're not truly saved. Therefore, it becomes a works-based system. I don't care how, what kind of verbal games you play. It becomes a, a, a works-based system. We say we believe in salvation by Christ alone, faith alone, uh, grace alone. We say all of that alone, 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 alone. And then you read the fine print and it says, but, 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 wait, 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 wait. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. However, if you're truly saved, you're going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, N, Z. We'll throw in some other letters. We'll throw in from other alphabets and other languages. We'll give you some more. I mean, we got to make sure our list is long because we've got all of these things you must do. And if you don't do them, you're not a genuine repenter. So you're saved by grace alone, but if you don't do these things, you were never saved. So my salvation then really is not about what Christ did. Christ just put me in a position so now I have the ability to keep everything. Because if I don't keep everything, then I'm not saved. And of course, immediately people say, no, 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 no. That's not what we're saying. That's not what we're saying. But that's what, that is what you're saying. If I'm a genuine repenter, if I'm a genuine repenter, I will fulfill the, the Sermon on the Mount. And I can keep it. And I, I'm assuming, look, look if, it's, if I can keep it by the power of the Holy Spirit, then obviously I can keep it perfectly. Right? I can live according to it. Or are you telling me the power of the Holy Spirit is not there? To, I can't live to it perfectly. Well, then, so how much power does the Holy Spirit have? Does he only give me 50% power, 60% power, 70% power? See, these are questions anyone listening to this kind of sermon should be having. Well, wait a minute. So I can keep it? So you're telling me everyone at that, look, obviously the people in Council Bluffs, Iowa are far more godly than the people here in Texas because I am. I will guarantee you the people in my church do not keep the Sermon on the Mount. I don't. Their pastor doesn't. So maybe we're just all devoid of the Holy Spirit because we haven't found that supernatural power. But here's what I've found. All the people who usually run around claiming they have supernatural power to keep God's word, you know what you ultimately find if you watch them long enough? You find failure and you find sin, and you find disillusionment, and you find discouragement, and you find depression, and you find broken marriages, and you find uh, fornication, and you find adultery, and you find porno uh, pornogra uh, pornography, and you find all kinds of messy things, because that's the lives of Christians. But we can pretend all day that, hey, here's the ethic of the kingdom, and you can follow it, because you have the Holy Spirit. You can do it. Now, someone will say, well, you can't do it perfectly. Okay, well, then what does that mean? <laughs> How much of it do I have to do to show that I'm a genuine repenter? 40%, 30%, 60%? And people will say, well, that's an absurd question. No, it's not, because it determines if I'm saved or not saved. It's a very, very much needed question. You see, this, this, this basically turns the Sermon on the Mount into a list that you check your, it's a checklist to determine if you're truly saved. And I, I think any honest, look, honest people who read God's word constantly say, woe is me, I'm undone. Honest people like Luther, 
We, we read all the historical accounts of how Luther spent hours and hours and hours in the confessional booth because he constantly felt unworthy and he knew he could not, he was not keeping up God's holy standards. If you truly will look at God's holy standards, you will see how unworthy you are. But somehow we convince ourselves that we keep it, that we do it, that we have power that our lost neighbors don't have. We have supernatural power. And then guess what? We show those lost neighbors over and over and over. We don't love them the way we're supposed to. We don't turn the other cheek. We don't, we, we don't follow the scriptures the way we're supposed to. Over and over and over we fall short. All right. We're, we, yeah, we didn't make it very far, but that's okay. This is getting us to how it's being interpreted, all right? We're, we're not even going to get to his exege, exegesis of Matthew 5, 1 through 12. He's just now giving us the, the, the method of interpretation. And the method of interpretation is Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 5 through 7 gives you the ethic that demonstrates if you're a genuine repenter. This is the ethics people who are in the kingdom of God will follow, and they will follow it because they have the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. As, as God in the, new, in the kingdom will enter into the new covenant relationship with his people, as we see elsewhere. But we are already under that new covenant. And what's the key to the new covenant? Uh, it's the Holy Spirit. As God's people, we have the Holy Spirit today. So as God's people, we are kingdom people, and we are to live accordingly. The kingdom is not here yet, because the king's not here yet. But we are to live in light of it as those whose citizenship is ultimately going to be in the kingdom. In chapter 4, Jesus lays down the necessity of repentance to enter the kingdom, as we saw in 417. Now in chapters 5 through 7, he lays out those, how those truly repentant should live and what is to characterize their lives. This kingdom ethic, as I call it, is what defines those who are truly repentant. You see, so, so Matthew 5 through 7 defines those who are truly repentant. This will define your life. Blessed are the pure in heart. Are you truly pure in heart? Are you truly pure in heart? See, see, we say these things so dogmatically, and then, and then we're going to have to backtrack because there's no way you, hey, only the people in this church are pure in heart. You're the, the, the true repenters. The rest of you are fake. Well, then everyone, all of you are lost, including me, because I'm not pure of heart. Oh, man. I, mm. But, but nobody, nobody will be bothered by this because this is just the standard way it's taught. But I, I, I'm bothered by it because I know the reality. The reality is you got people in that church who are a mess, just like the people in my church are a mess, just like I'm a mess. This can't be the way we interpret this. It, it just doesn't work. It sounds good, but it doesn't work in practice. It's almost like we preach it and then five seconds later we forget it. I mean, if, if, I, if I believe, okay, all right, Matthew 5 through 7, this shows that I'm a genuine repenter. By the time I got home from church, I would already go, wait a minute, I don't think I'm a genuine repenter because we already got in a fight on the way home from church with my, I got a fight with my kids and my wife and said something I shouldn't have said. I'm, I'm clearly, I'm clearly not a genuine repenter. And they're like, no, 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 you're just taking it too, too literal. It's either literally showing me what a genuine repenter is or it isn't. It can't be like this, play these little verbal games where we say it one way and then we backtrack when we get hit in the face with reality. Now, certainly, you know, there's, there's degrees of maturity, immaturity, and, we, and we, we struggle, we have the flesh, and all that's true. But uh, this is really what it means, what it should look like to live out repentance in light of the coming kingdom. Now, see, he acknowledges, okay, uh, you know, there's going to be different levels, and, and we're going to fail. We have the flesh. Okay, well then, so then how do I know if I'm a genuine repenter? If, if there's different levels of maturity, then that means, hey, that person over there doesn't seem to be following Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, but he's immature, so, so it doesn't count for him? He's got the power of the Holy Spirit, so why does he need, why is there immaturity? He doesn't know how to use the power yet? He's got the power of the Holy... Like, I'm so confused. You still have the flesh. You're still going to fall. You're still going to sin. Well, then how much sin can I do before I no longer a genuine repenter? 
See, you, you, you've got to articulate this. You've got to make it clear. It just becomes a bunch of, you know, this is what happens. It becomes a lot of words that ultimately don't mean anything in practice. It sounds good in theory. It's, it's a theoretical idea that no one really puts into to practice. If everyone in the church really stopped and go, man, we got to really figure this out. I think the conclusion would be is none of us are genuine repenters. All right, let's let's try to get to a stopping point here. Here we go. Howard Voss says this. The purpose of the the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount, which is not to present the way of salvation, but principles of character and conduct for those who are members of the kingdom, who already belong to Christ. You see, the Sermon on the Mount assumes you've responded to the message of repentance in chapter 4. Now how should we then live? Chapters 5 through 7. As kingdom citizens, this is how God's people should live as so instructed by the king. Now, I got no problem saying this is how we should live. Here's the ethics which we should follow. The problem is we're not going to do it anywhere close to perfectly. We don't have some supernatural power in order to do so. See, here's the thing. You can't, you can't on one hand say, hey, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the power to do it, and then turn around and make all the excuses for people not doing it. Either you have the Spirit or you don't have the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, you have the power. If you have the power, then you should do it. And if you don't do it, then you're not a genuine repenter. But you can't then try to, well, you know, this is, I got no problem saying we should live according to this. The issue is what we're going to discover is that we, we don't. We fall short. So I need, I need salvation from something outside of me. I need it in someone who did keep it perfectly. There was someone who came in the flesh who kept the Sermon on the Mount perfectly. And his name was Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God. And guess what happened? His passive and active obedience is imputed to me. So in Christ, I keep the Sermon on the Mount and my position and my practice. I strive to, but I'm going to fall short over and over and over again. And clearly I don't have some supernatural power that makes me somehow have supernatural ability to be more better, to be better than everyone else. Because if we did 2000 years of church history, wouldn't be filled with so many, much failure and sin that we constantly find. And we were always shocked when it happened. <gasps> did you hear what so-and-so did? <gasps> did you hear what so-and-so did? <gasps> did you hear what so-and-so did? Okay, yeah, theirs was scandalous, but <gasps> did you see what you did this week? Did you see how you treated your neighbor? Did you see how you treated your kids? Did you see how you did this? Did you see that you didn't hunger and thirst for righteousness? Did you see that you weren't pure in heart? Did you see that you looked at a woman and committed lust in your heart, even though you did not commit physical adultery? Did you not see your own failure and your own sin and your own unrighteousness? So how about you go, <gasps> What? look at what I did. But no, we were, we were only worried about the people who commit the big scandalous sins. And then we're like, I, I, I don't know if they were ever saved. But we pat ourselves on the back thinking, I'm really good. I'm really good because you know what? I have the Holy Spirit and I keep God's law. I keep the Ten Commandments. I keep the uh, the Sermon on the Mount because, and if we can keep it, then I, well, I don't even, we don't even need to ever ask for forgiveness. But then we're like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do it perfectly. We're just, yeah, well... <laughs> We're not going to do it perfectly, but I have the power of the Holy Spirit to, and able to keep it, but I'm not going to do it perfectly. So I guess the Holy Spirit can't make me perfect. He just, I, I don't even understand this. Like if I start try to write, I need a, I need a flow chart. So I have the power of the Holy Spirit to keep it, but I'm not going to keep it perfectly. But if I don't keep it enough, then I prove I'm not a genuine repenter. So exactly what am I left with here? I don't know. All right. We'll just go a couple more minutes. A couple of footnotes. First, Matthew 5-7 through is the first of five major discourses in Matthew. In addition to chapters 5-7, through the, the Sermon on the Mount discourse. And, and really, probably better called discourse than sermon, but it's commonly known as Sermon on the Mount, so we'll continue to call it that. But uh, you have that discourse in chapters 5-7, through then also chapter 10, chapter 13, chapters 18-20, through in chapters 24 through 25. Five separate discourses. Second, the discourse in Matthew 5 through 7 has similarities to what has been called the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6, verses 17 through 49. But it also has dissimilarities. And so the scholars debate here. 
Uh, as to whether these are two different sermons on two different occasions, or whether they just overlap in terms of content. And you can make a good argument for either case. It's, it's kind of uncertain. Well, let's pick it up. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. All right, we'll stop right there. So, hey, that was his introduction. His introduction, his introduction went 12 minutes. We spent an hour analyzing his introduction. And at the conclusion of his introduction, he didn't give an outline of the sermon. He didn't outline the sermon, which is kind of an interesting approach. Um, may, I guess maybe as he goes through, an outline will develop because clearly the first part of his outline would be Sermon on the Mount or, or Beatitudes, I should say, which is Matthew 5 and, and 1 through 12. All right, so... He's getting ready to get into the Beatitudes. That he, he see, we're stopping at the twelve minute and fifty one mark. Uh, twelve minutes and fifty one minute. Twelve, twelve minutes and fifty one seconds. Let me write this down really quick. Twelve minutes, fifty one seconds. All right, twelve minutes, fifty one seconds. Um, so, how can we summarize his introduction? His introduction is this: How do you interpret the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount is for you right now, if you are a Christian, because this sermon shows you if you're genuinely a repenter, if you're genuinely a citizen of the kingdom, if you're genuinely a part of the kingdom, if you don't live according to this, it, it may be evidence that you're not truly a true repenter, you're not truly a part of the kingdom of God, and you need salvation. Because if you have salvation, you now have the power of the Holy Spirit in which you can now obey this, and you can now follow this. But, 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 but he does throw in just a, a brief little like, but, 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 you know, we do understand that there may be immaturity and that we still have the flesh. He doesn't really explain how that works. He doesn't really articulate in any way. He doesn't give anyone any real idea. So this is what it does. It just tells everyone, hey guys, this is what, how we live. This is how we live. We, we all do this. But I, I, yeah. If you have, I, I still don't get it. If you have the power of the Holy Spirit to let you obey it, then why wouldn't you obey it? You just, well, is the flesh more powerful than the spirit? Well, okay, well, if, if the flesh is winning against the spirit for a period of time, then am I not a genuine repenter? Like, how do I, like, there's got to be some way to figure this out. And so what we do is basically here's, here's how it works. Matthew 5 through 7. This is the way it works. This is the way Christians, this is the game Christians play. Christians have been playing this game forever. This is the game you play. Matthew 5 through 7. This proves if you're a genuine repenter, if you're gen genuinely a Christian. Now, there's a lot of things in here that we're all going to sin all the time. We're going we're gonna to commit these sins all the time. We're going to fall short. 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 The only things that really matter are any of these scriptures that talk about big sins. Now, we know the big ones. Sex, oh, oh man, if you commit a sexual sin, that's it. You're probably not a genuine. Now there's plenty of these other ones where you, you, know, you may not turn the other cheek. You may not love your enemy. You, you may constantly trying to be resist evil instead of resisting not evil. You, you may not be truly pure in heart. You may not do a lot of these things, but as long as you don't commit a sexual sin, you're okay. Now don't commit murder. You don't, don't commit murder. As long as you don't commit murder, as long as you don't commit a sexual sin, then you're okay. You're a genuine repenter, right? Now, even divorce, even though Jesus, we had to work around that whole divorce thing he has discussions about because, you know, no, you know, that, that, could, that could call a, a question, you know, a lot of people if they're genuine or repent because they're divorced. So we, we got to find a way to make sure that all the divorced people feel okay because we don't want them to feel bad. So, so ultimately what you do is you should pick out a couple of big things. And as long as you don't commit one of those big things, then you're okay. You're okay. You're a genuine repenter because you didn't commit any of the big ones. Now you could be committing the small ones, the venial ones. And I know Protestants get mad when I use a venial and mortal sins because like, that's a Catholic thing. We've got, we do the same thing. I don't know why we act like we're so much better than Catholics. We have our own list. Here's the mortal sin. Oh, you committed a mortal one. I don't, it's right there in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you're not a genuine repenter. But look at your life. I know, but I commit the smaller ones and I just commit the smaller ones all the time. So I'm still good. I, by the time I'm done with that introduction, I have no idea how to even take this sermon and do anything with it. That was, that to me makes the sermon utterly useless, utterly meaningless. And you can't do anything with what he just said. I have the power of the Holy Spirit to keep it, but hey, we're not going to really keep it. But if I don't keep it enough, I'm not a genuine repenter. Well, if I have the Holy Spirit, then I should be able to keep it, right? So why don't I? 
Well, it could be a lack of immaturity. It could be a, you have the flesh. Yeah, but isn't the spirit more powerful? Isn't it the spirit of God? Isn't it powerful enough to accomplish anything? Well, I mean, you can't do it perfectly. Okay, well, so then how do I know when I'm ju- – what what level of uh, obedience to the Sermon on the Mount must I achieve before I know I'm a genuine repenter? And if you don't answer that question, then your whole method of interpretation just re- basically renders the entire passage meaningless. And useless. Now we'll see. We'll see. Now that's that's the method he offers of interpreting it. Now let's say if he stays consistent with that through the exposition of the sermon. He just gave us his hermeneutic. His hermeneutic is this proves if you're a genuine repenter or not. Now let's see how far he takes that. As soon as you get into the Beatitudes, well, if you don't do this, you're not a genuine repenter. Is he going to say that time and time and time again? And hey, you can do this with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let, let's see if he stays consistent with it. We can't do that now, but we'll do that. You can give me your thoughts, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. There we go. We'll, we'll be back. Uh, we'll try to get back to this tomorrow, and we'll pick it up at the 12 minute and 51 second mark. All right, thank you for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.